TEDx seminar. Our speaker today is Fernando Fernando Quiero, and he joins us from University of California, Santa Cruz. You pronounced correctly. He yeah. commented actually the uh, workshop too. That's good at being correctly quite often. Okay. Uh, but he'll be talking about the status of the women report. Right. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here again. <coughs> quite cold this time. <laughs> <laughs> so. In this talk, I'll give a brief overview of the Wimp Miracle. I'll start very, I'll talk in a very general way about dark matter. So everybody from abroad, expertise can understand what's going on here. And later, it'll be very specific, okay, towards the end. <coughs> in case any questions, you just interrupt me anytime. Don't leave it towards the end, okay? Just ask. I don't have many slides, so we're just chatting and then we can ask our questions. Feel free to. <coughs> so, what's the wind miracle? So, the idea is that dark matter particles in the early universe were annihilating to a sudden mortal particles. But as the universe cooled down, those and expanded those universe to dark matter particles were no longer able to annihilate dark matter particles, so they froze out. And those left over dark matter particles are the particles that we can observe today. Okay? So in this plot right here, it's just you have the Let's say that's the abundance, okay? It's the abundance of dark matter particles. That's the temperature of the universe. <clears throat> so as the, the temperature increases, decreases, so or as the universe expands, you can see the abundance of dark matter particles decreases. But at some point, the freeze out happens, and then you have some constant leftover abundance of dark matter particles, okay? The, the weaker they interact, the weaker they interact, more, the more abundant the dark matter particles we have today. If they interact strongly, so you have fewer left dark matter particles. Okay, that's everything so far? Well, I like to always talk about dark matter in a not, not so boring way. And the, <clears throat> the idea of these stars of the wind miracle comes, can be explained in a few slides in this cartoon right here. So how the, the, does that come about? So in the, the, we have a demo, which is a long-standing result that requires some modulation that are that is consistent with the dark matter interpretation. It's not saying that's dark matter, but it's consistent with WIMPs carrying off the crystals of sodium iodine. And we have Koenig was in early early 2010, roughly. They also observed in that time some excess events that could be explained by dark matter particles. And then people like my former supervisor, Dan Hooper, and, and New Wine or whoever you like most, they were claiming, woohoo, we discovered dark matter. However, shortly after Xenon 100 came, he said, no, those events you guys are seeing are not dark matter. So <clears throat> those guys who are here started claiming, well, there are some scintillation efficiency issues in the xenon detector that might remedy <coughs> this whole picture, actually make the wings, the region that of Fermi space that dark matter particles can explain the access is still viable. It's not ruled out by the xenon hundred. <coughs> and to make a very long story short, we had we have now CDMS silicon events. We have lugs. I put AMS on the other side. Someone might ask me that later, why I was biased to choose that side of the road. If I'm telling you that this is this side of this side over here is the dark matter interpretation, and this side over here is saying that's not dark matter. And 
after those signals, those no results from logs, you know, 100 EMS light and so on and so forth. So those guys, the dark matter guys, were walking towards the non-dark matter interpretation, like saying, okay, I give up. It's not dark matter then. And <clears throat> there were people still claiming that there were ways around it, how you could still have dark matter particles that could explain those signals without not be, without being ruled out by current measurements, such as Jerry Drava, who is a is a detector guy at Stanford. He claimed that if you have few GV wings, like one GV wing, you could explain the dumbest signal as scattering off sodium only for some weird reason. Uh, I don't know. He just said, let's assume for now that we just seen it right with sodium. I have one GV wing scattered just with sodium. I, I don't care about iodine. Just for now. He said, okay, we can get a cross section that might explain gamma, and because it's one GV wind at that time would be away, would be below the energy threshold of the direct production experiments. We didn't have the CDMS like results at that time. <clears throat> but, and then one week after, is Stefan Perfume and I, what we did was, okay, let's check how reasonable that assumption is. He was right. If you, from some weird, crazy assumption that we just interact only scatter off sodium, you can do explain the dumb signal. But he's wrong when he says that he's not ruled out by current constraints. Yes, you are. Okay, and we show that the is ruled out by force signal. But I don't want, I won't get into the details of that. <coughs> and after this whole picture, we have the hope wrong. Right? The Hooper on is just, Hooper keeps putting out papers regarding the galaxy axis. And so people call it Hooper on. And we were crazy enough that we wrote a paper with the Hooper on. I think that was the first time in the literature someone was crazy enough to do that. Where we show that the, what kind of effective operators someone can come up with and it's to explain the got center access not being ruled out by LHC, whatever direct detection, direct detection, whatever you can think of. <clears throat> we had this great news very recently, which was, I think it was April, I think, this year. Hooper found the dark matter access. That's a break news, which is the gamma ray access that I was talking about, but this time it was just focused on dark matter related to quarks. Okay. That was a great news of the year. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit more about this black center access so we can so have an overall idea of what's going on in this wind miracle regime. <clears throat> so what's the hope round is all about? We using Fermi led data, okay, which is the NASA's uh, satellite. <clears throat> They found some axis in the galaxy, gamma ray axis towards the 1 GV ish energy window, 1 GV, 3 GV energy window. And here it shows what the spectrum of this axis looks like right? for a given gamma. What's the gamma is? the NFW profile, dark matter profile, there is a gamma dependency in there. If a gamma is equal to one, means it's just vanilla NFW profile. If it's gamma is greater than one, you're saying just that the dark matter halo profile is steeper than your previously thought. So he's just saying that you need a steeper dark matter profile towards the galactic center, which is sort of what we expected, okay? And then, <coughs> Given that spectrum, I can use fifty. Uh, you can use, you know, not micromagnets. You can use Cirelli's code and then compute the gamma ray spectrum coming out of some dark matter relation. So what that is is you just fix. It's very easy. It's a mathematical one of those, and no, no, the shift enter codes in Mathematica, where. You can put the gamma ray coming from dark matter relation, just fix the mass and the relation cross section, giving a particular funny state. 
That's it. That's all you need. Three things. Then you compute the gamma ray spectrum. So if, if I give you this spectrum right here, you can compute the what is the best fit region that reproduce this spectrum in terms of the annihilation cross section and the mass. Okay? That's all they did. And they found in this paper, which was confirmed by several different groups, that <coughs> dark matter is real. Nobody can doubt that. That dark matter positives can really it can explain the excess. Okay? Nobody in this room or anywhere in the world will say otherwise. You can fit the data well. And in this paper, they show the chi squared, not the chi squared per degrees of freedom. They just show the total chi squared. I don't know why. And they said, okay, in this, in our analysis, we find that the chi squared, the data, has a bias towards dark matter relating to quarks instead of leptons, okay? Because they say the chi-square is poor to leptons when dark matter relates to leptons. However, <coughs> one could ask, is this a real signal? Is just an application of Greenman theorem? Or any competent theoretician can fit any given theory data to any given set of facts. Okay? Let's go. <laughs> before, before going to that, so, well, but you guys live along theory, so you know that that's a very true principle, right? <laughs> Hi, you. Uh, the what? So before I go into the uh, discussion to whether or not this is a real signal, just like to point out what's the particle physics interpretation of this signal. Okay. So in that Hoopron paper, which is a packet Hoopron paper right here, we showed what kind of channels one should have to explain the galaxy center axis and maybe not being excluded by other searches. Okay. Those are like pseudo-scalar mediators. You can have those mixing between vector axial and vector mediators. You can have also scalar. These guys are fermions, are the dark matter part. So you can have fermions with pseudo-scalar mediators. And you can have scalars with pseudo-scalar mediators or just dual interactions. Just a bunch. I don't expect anybody to remember what was D2, D6, C2, C6. I don't care. Okay. Everybody has to has just have to have one take-home message, which is I'm going to give an overview of the wind miracle. You might remember the ideas of what I'm talking about. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. I don't I don't expect you to remember what was the region of the prime space for that explaining the whole problem. No, you don't need to remember that. You just look into the paper. Just the idea, so focus on the idea of the problem. And 90 papers have been written so far on this. So theorists are very good at that. <clears throat> and also Hooper put out a paper shortly after us where he listed, outlined what kind of simplified dark matter models someone could come up with and still be consistent with other searches. We, they at first order, we agree with each other, okay? <clears throat> Why I say first order? Because we use effective operators, and they use simplified vibrations. So we have a, we don't have a mediator, they have. So uh, the LHC bounds, they'll be different, and that's what you expect. What is the point of the number? Which number? Mother number, one, two, two, no, it's because it it's, uh, belongs to the same mediator, spin zero, zero, oh. and it's a fermion fermion. So it just changed the nature of the fermion. So that's one. For instance, like this one. Direct fermion, direct fermion, direct fermion, direct fermion, and spin one, spin one, one. That's why it's. And then he call it, I don't know why he, okay, wait. <laughs> why do you call it two, three, four? 
I'm trying to recall it. Three, four, five. Well, they, 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 I don't know why he called it. There are, I know there are, I remember that there are eight. Eight directions of difference. One is gamma mu, the other one is axial mu. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. But the most important thing is, is that there are eight class of models that can currently, eight class of models that you can come up with and explain the Huberon axis. That's the take home message regarding this Huberon axis in terms of from a particle physics perspective. And many of them, you, you won't see in the foreseeable future any constraints. For instance, LAC reach, maybe, 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 yes, 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 yes. And then direct attraction, never, no, never, never, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. So few cases, then you, they are probable. You can probe them at LAC or direct attraction experiments. Huh? Is it actually no? Yeah, this ain't no. Yeah, the powers. <laughs> That's right. It's Q4. So forget it. <laughs> yeah, these powers of the the moment exchange. So. And just a reminder is that in those galactic center simplified dark matter models, you can always derive gamma rays constraints using the galactic center data. That uh, Dan and I, we, I think was maybe it was I might be wrong. That was I think it was the first time in the literature that someone showed the constraints bin by bin using the Fermi data. So it's very easy. Well, I'm more a particle physicist than an astrophysicist. So when we were working on this, I said we should be we should derive astrophysics bounds for particle physicists. So we should got this whole quantity because the, this is the particle physics quantity in the flux, right? The other one is astrophysics. So astrophysics, no, I, I'm more particle physics. So let's just bound the particle physics quantity so everybody can just come up with a model and then compute that thing and compare it with the total flux we found and then draw a bounds in their annihilation cross section for a given any annihilation channel you can think of. <coughs> So now the hoop run from <coughs> that should be astrophysics perspective, not particle physics perspective. And it, when was in March? March. March this year, Joseph Silk and collaborators, Marco Cirelli also had a paper in this topic where they showed that if you include universe company scattering, Actually, the previous claim from the Hooper and collaborators that saying that the inflation to leptons provide a very poor fit is no longer true. However, I was there is no paper written in that topic. It seems that if dark matter truly annihilates into tau leptons, let's say, or leptons in the finite state, they are seem to be excluded by AMSO2. But we had a long discussion in the afternoon talking about this with you, Gal, Bosk, and everybody, that you can my remedy that. So you can come up with different background models to change that assumption. Maybe with the vanilla background models, if you have a dark matter particle that annihilates into tau leptons, and you want to explain the galaxy center axis, you ruled out by AMS. That's what it says. We need a more quantitative answer to that. And that would be the hadrons versus leptons. So it seems for now that hadrons seems to be the, the right answer. Okay? Not the right answer in the terms that they provide a better fit, but it seems that the one that provide a fit that it still survives the current day. And what about Cosmic ray, cosmic ray models, gas distribution, magnetic fields, and so on and so forth. It was a paper from, uh, did I put it here? I didn't. Um, oh, I didn't. So sorry if someone has seen this. Uh, Vinegar, uh, Ilias, and Calori put out a paper where they tried to account for the systematics in the galaxy center and see if we change some gas models like cosmic ray distribution, magnetic fields, the galaxy center access in the Fermi data is still there. 
and they found it is. So even if they come up with different gas models, so it doesn't seem to be a mismodeling of something so far. So they found this, they found, yeah, wait, so we changed these wide, we had different assumptions, wide, different models and everything, and we still find the access in the firm data. So it seems to be a very compelling result so far. So one could ask, okay, besides dark matter, what could explain this access? We had the pulsars interpretation. Stefano, my current supervisor, he's claiming that maybe pulsars can be, or even pulsars can't explain the access. Maybe we have some astrophysical processes going on that we don't know about. So it's too soon to claim that that's dark matter there. But everybody agrees that the, the access is there. So you, you can't doubt that so far. So the reason why it should be dark matter and not pulsars is because the axis extends up to 10 degrees of the center of the galaxy. The axis is very centered around Sagittarius A. And we, using the pulsars observed by Fermilab today, using the, the pulsars, they have some luminosity function. Using extrapolating, you'll say, let's say that the pulsars we know today, let's say we have some, some of them around the glass center using the same properties, let's say I have them. I didn't observe, I'm just saying, assume they are, that I haven't seen so far. Well, how many pulsars we would need to explain the excess? 2,000. So you would need 2,000 millisecond pulsars to explain the excess. That's what Dan is like. However, <coughs> there was very recent one question we raised with Stefano was, is the galaxy center really not ruled out by forming dwarfs? Well, they are ruled out. The galaxy center axis is actually ruled out by forming dwarfs if, and only if, there are intermediate massive black holes in dwarf galaxies. Okay? That's uh, 2014 06, so it was in June of this year where what we did was we took Fermi dwarfs 2014 data, not PSA, that was previous PSA. PSA. So we took their data, and what we did was, let's include the intermediate massive black hole in there, and see what happened with the constraints, okay? So the current constraints are like this. Let me, let me pick one line. So let, these, can you, everybody see this line right here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the current constraints are like this curve right here, something like this. However, if you see that you include intermediate massive black holes in dwarf galaxies, those constraints, they shift by orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude. I would like to emphasize that I'm not advocating the presence of black holes in dwarf galaxies. I'm just saying, if they, if they are black holes, they will happen, okay? That's what's gonna happen, if they are black holes, there. Why, why did I come up with this great assumption out of thin air? No, there are some three independent observations that what they took the, they measured the velocity dispersion of the stars of some dwarf galaxies, and they said, well, if we include black holes with masses up to whatever, what's three, three to 10 to three, 10 to four solar masses, they can, we can still match the data reasonably well. So there is no bias towards no black holes, and there is no bias towards, yeah, there are black holes. So it's, the data is, doesn't care, okay? Given that fact, you'll say, okay, if it doesn't care, it gives them also to can describe the velocity dispersion of the stars. Let's see what happens regarding the dark matter output. So that's what happens. So the constraints get much stronger, and this blue region right here is a region that explains the hoopron. So the hoopron, this is just the individual constraints. You can use, we performed also electrical analysis to get the joint one. 
which is also ruled out. I think I show that in the next slide. And we also exclude the whole program region, which is this one. Okay. So this is the Fermi. This is the black one. This is the current Fermi one, which did not exclude. That was prior to pass A. Okay. So we have this is the Fermi one, the black one. So we said, okay, now we have an FW. I don't remember if we showed here the mass of black hole. Yes, for instance, this dash dotted one. Mass of black hole, mass, did we show? Yeah, it's 550, 100, solar, yeah, 50 solar masses, so 100 solar mass, 22, for instance, this dash one, which is right here. So if we include, insert a black hole of 10 to 2 solar masses, that's what happens to the constraints. That's the Fermi, black. That's ours, dashed. This is the hoop region, right here. So it's excluded by roughly a factor of 8. So if you have intermediate mass black holes, you have the option to increase the blocks that explain the geometry. Yeah. Because it, what we're simply doing is this. So the flux is proportional to sigma v over m squared, mass of the dark matter squared, m chi, times a j factor. So let's say this, fact, this j factor is equal to 1 in the vanilla case. Okay? Just normalize it to 1. When you include a black hole, this J factor increases. Why? Well, it does not necessarily increase. It depends on how the black hole was formed. In our case, we made the assumption that it was increasing, and we have several papers that support that idea, that if you insert a black hole in one galaxy, the J factor increases. But we can discuss much more detail on that. Let's say black hole, the J factor increases, okay? This thing is measured, okay? This is fixed. So if this is fixed, this increases by, let's say, one order or two order of magnitude, I have to change that thing. For, the, for a given fixed dark matter mass, I have to decrease sigma v to get the same measured phi. So you, your constraints get stronger in the sense that because you need lower sigma v, that's exactly what's happening. Okay. J, J is actually measured. Yeah, J is measured. So you can't just willingly really increase it. Yeah, but I can increase that with for instance, the velocity dispersion of the galaxy. That's the measured thing. Yeah, but the, the J is derived from that. It's derived from that. So how, how are you just arbitrarily increasing this? Yeah, I can increase, for instance, this thing, I have some error bars in that thing, right? But let's say this is measured. And this, this is not measured country. The velocity dispersion is a measure of quantity. Yeah. So from the velocity dispersion, and then you say vanilla and FW, I compute that thing, and then I compare it with this, I get sigma v over n. Yeah. I mean, well, the flux, the flux, the uncertainty of the flux you get comes from the measurements and the uncertainties on the j's. That's so right. That's so you can't just say, I want to increase the j to just as much as I want. That's right, as long as it's within the square root of phi. It has to be within the error bars. But remember, because I have a generacy, this function, I have no idea what that is. Yeah. And this thing, you have some input on this thing, but I have no idea what that is. And this has to be equal to the error bars that I have in my flux. So I can within the error part of this, I can do this thing I cannot just like increase randomly. But this thing I can do whatever the hell I want. Yeah, I agree. But, but J, you can't, you can't increase J arbitrarily either. No, not, not arbitrarily. You have to change. That's why, for instance, the galaxy we were talking about were 10 to 7 solar masses. And the, the black hole masses were like 10 to 2, 10 to 3. That was like 100. So you're not messing up with the velocity dispersion of the stars. Is the, is the profile getting much steeper in the center? Is that what's happening? Yeah, it's steeper. Okay. 
it was steeper. If it's steeper, then you get, if you were not steeper before. That's, that's, I think that's the way out. And there's also a crucial assumption is that, for example, I was saying, we can discuss that in more detail because the J factor does not necessarily increase when you say, when you put a black hole in there. Because it depends on how the black hole was formed. Okay, and there are some astrophysical things. And I know a little bit about it. I'm not an astrophysicist, but there are some caveats to that. So we had that assumption. We had the intermediate massive black holes because they were, they, the data was not claimed there was no black holes or the other way around. So I say, okay, if there were black holes, what happens to the dark matter? I, and then the big assumption comes. Which assumption is that? Saying that this J factor increases. If the J factor increases, and then this thing goes down. And in order to determine what's the mass of the black holes in which one of those dwarf galaxies, we use three different methods to say to one very extreme, extreme in the point in the sense that was predicting very massive black holes, and one that's very, very mild, saying that the mass of the black hole is really low. And the same question again, is the Hoopron excluded by dwarf galaxies? No, there are not black holes in dwarf galaxies. And we had a steeper dark matter profile. Why I'm saying this? Because that's, I took this from Fermi Symposium, okay? Fermi Symposium, those are the current uh, favorite region to explain the galaxy center axis cross-section, in relation cross-section in terms of the mass. Right here, right here. The only difference is because this one has a steeper profile because the dark matter density is assumed to be 0.4. This one was 0.3. So in this region right here, for instance, the Hoopron region, the official Hoopron region is the red one. So it would be excluded by current Fermi lab class 8, which is this blue curve. If you go to a steeper profile, and then you can escape Fermi dwarfs limit. So you need a steeper profile, which is fine because that's exactly what many groups have found that the gamma, this NFW profile that has gamma equal one when it's vanilla NFW profile, that gamma should be greater than one to fit the data. So that's sort of what we previously expected. And that's the indirect detection limits because we have Hooper. So I, I wasted some time to figure out what was the, which one of those guys were born, where we were born. <laughs> and there is a space available, so you can put it in your plot right here. Why I'm saying this? Because look at this plot. Do they necessarily agree with each other? Yeah, more or less, right? They don't exactly match a favorite region. So don't ask me why. So there is some space available for the dark matter lamps. And we got also again regarding this galaxy center axis, there is uh, what we should do to determine whether or not we have some dark matter access there. That's the astrophysical point of view. Well, there are systematics that Vinegar already started working on that. Gas model, data-driven background models, and there's one working team that is currently currently being done in collaboration with Stefan Profum and Tim and Eric Carson. And this paper was pretty good. I think it was the first paper that someone did a comprehensive systematic analysis of the glass center. And we are working more towards that. <clears throat> but mostly focus on data-driven background models, okay? And now, let's say, okay, given this whole mass you heard down, uh, CDMS, Silicon, Galaxy Center Access, how is the WIMP miracle when regarding simplified dark matter models? Not focus on the Galaxy Center, okay? Just given current direct and direct detection constraints and collider. We have some, there are so many. Bhaskar, if you talk to him in five minutes, you'll come up with 10 different simplified dark matter models. <laughs> One of them, let's say, is Z prime. The Z prime, what means is, is that just Z 
C-frame is the mediator between the dark sector and the visible sector. <coughs> Every time you hear someone saying Higgs portal, so Higgs is the mediator between the dark sector and the visible sector. Z-prime portal, the same thing, Bosker portal, Bosk is the mediator between the dark sector and the visible sector. Okay? And there are many different setups. You can make the couplings different, crazy, the, we can do what, what the hell you want with them, as long as it's consistent with current data. <clears throat> there are setups, for instance, where the Z prime is leptophilic, where the Z prime only interacts with lapids for some reason. Okay, you can come up with particle physics model that does that. So let's try to do it in a more independent way. I'm not saying what gauge symmetry I have. I'm not saying what kind of I know, uh, extension of the certain model I have. I'm just saying that we have a dark matter and we have a Z prime interacts only with lapids. That's all I say. So when Basper come up with a model that Z prime is leptophilic, he can just use those lines. Okay, that's the idea. That's why everybody, if you've seen the literature, they were, I think today, were four simplified dark matter models. Yesterday, six, and then that goes on, on and on and on. <clears throat> just like to point out there, there is one public code for computing the, the mu magnetic moment that Will Shepard and I wrote in early this year, which is also again one of those shifty enter programs in Mathematica. Okay, it's very straightforward. Leptophobic, that's the next slide, so I'll be very brief about that. And there is a general case which is is we appear so in our archive with Ben and Stefano. <coughs> Let me just go to this. So the idea is, whatever you can think of, you have a given dark, you have a given dark matter model. What you want to do is compare with current data, direct, indirect detection, and collider. So what you do is, the easy thing regarding simplified dark matter models, you don't have too many free parameters, okay? Compared to Susie, for instance. <coughs> If you look at this indirect detection where dark matter, dark matter related to dark matter particles, you have some coupling here that I don't know what that is, and some coupling here. So I have two couplings that will determine how strongly the dark matter particle interacts with the external model particles. Okay? And those couplings are present here and here. So I have two couplings. Okay? That's it. And of course, the masses of the particles. But totally, I have those two. And then I can derive all the signals and plot limits in regarding those couples. Okay? Combine all of them. So that's what we did in this paper. I would like to just call attention to something that people don't usually talk about, which is a misconception the Z prime portal. Not in the Z prime portal, but in a very general way. So people usually talk about dark matter, that's the way I usually don't, I particularly don't like, is in terms of spin dependent and speed dependent interactions. However, this is just quite misleading. Why? Because there are some interactions that people co often call spin independent, but they truly are not. Look at this, for instance, this, just one thing, everybody knows what spin dependent is the tricky question. Don't think that's that easy. What spin independent and spin dependent means? Okay, I'll take you as a bit. What is spin independent means? Uh, spin independent means like it doesn't depend on the spin of the dark matter. Of the dark matter? Everybody agrees with that? The nucleus. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy as you think. You're so used to say spin dependent, spin dependent, but you don't usually think spin dependent of what? Dark matter spin or the nucleus is spin? Nucleus. That's okay. Now you won't forget it anymore in your whole life. <laughs> <laughs> so, for this operator, when you have vector and vector interactions, so we have this is a 
the amplitude, okay? So you have vector vector, you don't have any spin right here, you just have some constant. So this is called spin dependent, fine, and then it's truly spin dependent. Let's, let's say this one. This one is known, which is this one right here, O2, O2. It's called, it's often called spin independent. We go here, spin independent. We have the spin of the dark metal part, and we have the spin of the, but it's called spin independent. Why the hell people call it spin dependent if you have a dependence on the momentum, or on the, a dependence on the spin of the nucleus? Because there's a momentum dependence right here. So what problems such as micromegas, micromegas does is they take the limit where the momentum exchange goes to zero. So this thing goes to zero, you have just dependence on the spin of the dark matter, which is called the spin dark matter independent, spin dependent because it does not depend on the spin of the nucleus, not dark matter. Okay? So it's called spin dependent. But this is only true in the zero exchange momentum limit. Okay. So this is a misconception in this sense. This does not, all particle physics models do not obey this at all. Okay? There are many particle physics models where the exchange momentum is not zero. So you don't have a spin dependent, independent definition, like classification. You have to say, well, in the zero moment transfer limit, because this table, people are used to take it from micromegas. That's what exactly what they have. Spin dependent, spin dependent for each one of the operators. But if you read in detail, I think they have the footnote or something. You're taking the zero momentum transfer limit throughout the paper. <clears throat> so I will jump a little bit this monojet and dijet because it can explain in few slides. So. <clears throat> What monojet and dijet means? Doing monojet and dijet calculations is kind of boring. You spend lots of time in math graph and doing that whole thing. And at the end of the day, you come those with plots and one two plots. And wow! After all this trouble, I can have with one two plots. And it's, it seems to be complicated to understand. However, you you understand what monojet and dijet works like one or two plots. So you, you see from now on in the literature, people talking about monojet and dijet bounds, very fancy, complicated plots, but everything can be understood in two plots. That's it, okay? You just fancier ways to present results, but the physics behind it is all, they are all the same. Why? You see right here. <clears throat> so let's say, let's look at this one. You have PP, producing Z prime, and you have some quarks towards the end, okay? So you have one jet, one jet, die jet, die jet, baby. okay? So the Z prime, in this case, the Z prime is leptophobic. What that means is, the Z prime will only couples to quarks. That's why I have only quarks in the fine state. I'm not considering leptons, okay? So I just have Z prime and quarks. Well, if you look at this figure, this figure is the branch ratio of the Z prime into quarks as a function of their coupling. Which coupling is this? It's not this is a type of. This coupling is what GX is. GX, I'll put right here. G chi is the coupling between chi bar, chi, and the Z prime, okay? So the larger, the larger the G chi is, the stronger the dark matter particle couples to the Z prime. So okay, let's fix one coupling, G chi equal one. We go here, G chi equal one, the branch ratio is between six and seven. For dark matter mass of 10 G. When you go to 20, it's almost the same. When you go to 40, it changes a little bit. For Z prime mass of 100, for Z prime mass of 500 GV, if you have one coupling equal whatever value, let's say I'm choosing equal one, I'm change, changing the dark metal mass, which are those different curves, 
dark matter mass from 10 to 300, the, cup, the branch ratio of the Z prime to quarks is changing by like 10%. What I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say is, given one coupling, okay? Given one coupling, whatever that is. If I change the dark matter mass, the branch ratio of the Z prime to quarks does not change much. What kind of signal I'm interested in here? Is quark quark, which is dijon. So if I change the dark matter mass, I don't care much about this. The signal remains basically the same. Okay? I'm giving you a very like brief overview of what's going on. But everybody can understand this. There are way more details to that, but the overall picture can be understood in just this plot. So if I change, if I'm looking to this kind of signal, dijet, if I change the dark matter mass, I don't care. Those solid horizontal lines are the dijet production cross section. Look at the dark matter mass, it goes from zero to a thousand something. Does the production, dijet cross section change much? No. Why? Just look here. That might be a fancier plot, but I can look just branch ratio. Branch ratio is something that undergrad can use. Right? So the physics is, is very simple. And something similar can apply for the monojet, but the, the monojet bound, which is kind of this signal right here, where you have dark matter, dark matter, you have some EC energy and a jet coming out of here. Now, I care, I do care, about how the Z prime couples to dark matter. So I do care about the mass of the dark matter because the mass of the dark matter will determine the missing energy I have. So I do care about the mass of dark matter when it comes to monojet. So monojet, you have those curves right here, those dashed lines. They are very different for kinematics reasons. The production cross-section of monojet when it changes the dark matter mass. Okay? So let me show this plot right here. <coughs> this one we just show what's those plot, those horizontal spiky curves are the collider bounds, and these are the dijet bounds, and this one right here, the dashed one, is the monojet bound. And you can see that the, there is a quite important complementary between monojet and dijet, and they are sensitive to larger couplings when it comes to monojet, and not so sensitive when it comes to and not so sensitive when it comes to dijet. Friends, dijet are very sensitive. Friends, look at this. They are sensitive to small couplings, and there is a reason for that. This has to do also. You can just look at the branch ratios, and you will understand why. Dijets are sensitive to small couplings, whereas the monojets are not. And what I'm assuming here that the Z prime couples just like the Z, just like it. I was lazy that they just took from PD, PDG the Lagrangian from the Z, the Z and the Z prime. It's okay. Let's use the same Lagrangian to see what happens. That's what we got. Okay, the same couples, couples just like the Z. And then you say, but why did, you, why did you choose that for now? Well, I choose for one simple reason. I know how the Z couples in the standard model. So what happens if I change, if I depart from that assumption, let's say that the Z prime now couples, I know, 50%, I chose random, 50% suppressed compared to the Z ones. If I came here and told to everyone, hey, the couplings is 0.7. I don't know what that is, 0.7. I have no idea what that is. But if I tell you that the one particle couples, like right, 50% suppressed to the Z, you have a more physical meaning because you know how the Z couples. So I'm telling you now that the, in this case, the Z prime couples 50% compared to the Z. So let's compare the cases. Z prime equal to the Z, those are the constraints. When I go to 50% suppressed, that's what happens. The collider bounds go away. The digets, mostly. 
Z prime equal to the Z, and Z prime 50% suppressed couplings. And we did this for different weight masses. With this one for the 8 GV, for 130, 500, and so on. But the take home message of this Z prime portal, again, I'm just focused on the take, I want you guys just to be focused on the take home message. Don't remember what's the end, the mass range, which is not ruled out. You just look at the paper, that's fine. You can ask me later, send me an email, call me if you want. The take home message is if you have a simplified Z prime dark matter model, if you combine the direct detection, indirect detection, collided constraints, look at those curves. These, the black lines in each one of those curves sets the region of the parameter space which reproduces the right abundance. Okay? So if you want a dark matter model that gives you the right abundance, you have to lie in that black curve. If you see right here, this is excluded, excluded right there. That's okay a little bit, and this one is also okay a little bit. Dark matter mass 500 GV. But the only thing we can see in common in all of them is that when you sit in at the resonance, then you can have a viable simplified Z prime model that obeys the current constraints. This one is okay just at the resonance. This one is okay just at the resonance. And we did for several dark matter masses, okay? 15, 1,000, 2,000. We also did for 50, 50% suppressed couplings, 90% suppressed couplings, and so on and so forth. Just showing a few slides. So take home message, Z prime portal, you have to be at the resonance to be consistent with data, okay? As simple as that. And what about the Higgs pore? The Higgs pore is very, everybody talks about it. So I'll skip a few slides and talk about the, the most important thing, which is this point. Comes, everything comes out to this point. Let's say we have Higgs pore. Again, Higgs pore is just, the Higgs is the mediator between the dark sector and the visible sector. And this lambda is just saying how strongly the dark metal particles couples to the <coughs> Higgs, okay? That's it, that's what this lambda is. And this is the dark matter mass. It's a scalar in this case. This is in the visible width of the Higgs bound, just saying that the range ratio of the Higgs into invisible particles have to be around 15%-ish, 20%, something like that, depends on which data set you use. <coughs> and if you, this green region is the, this green curve is the curve, is the region, determines the original parameter space which give, reproduce the right abundance. So if you want a dark matter model that explains the right abundance, you have to be in that curve, okay? And you look right here. Those are the current lux constraints. And those are the projected xenon one time. So the lux, already excludes almost everything, so you have a dark matter mass that have to be like around larger than a couple of a hundred or, or so GV. Otherwise, you have to be at the resonance. So you need a very, uh, not heavy, I wouldn't call it heavy, but over a hundred GV dark matter mass to be consistent with current data. And if you take into account xenon one time constraints, that will be very surprised if they observe some signals, dark matter signals. So it may be 2017, I guess, is Xenon one time. So in two years or so from now, we will see that on the whole one below one TV Higgs portal is excluded. You have to be at the resonance. One thing that I'd like to emphasize that is not in this plot and is not probably nobody's thoughts in these slides is that we are talking about simplified dark matter models. You have to keep that in mind all the time. Why? I showed you this region of the parameter space which gives you the right abundance, okay? Given any particle physics model you can think of, even Basker won't come up with one that is, does not, sorry, it's a, does not 
contradict, which contradicts with what I'm going to talk about. You have a dark mirror model that gives you the right abundance. You can extend that model to suppress that abundance. But you won't come up with a model that will enhance that one. Unless you have in a given model, with miracle, you have that model and you want to enhance that model. It will be very hard. I have just I just know one case that will do that, but I won't tell you. You have just one one specific regime where you can enhance that abundance. Otherwise you will just suppress. Why? Space phase. If you include more particles which your dark matter particle can annihilate, you just decrease the abundance. Okay? So what that means is I can this part right here, if I have, but for now, this is a singlet scalar model. If I have doublets, if I have triplets, singlet plus doublet plus whatever, plus Bhaskar working on it, you can shift that thing down. You can shift, you can shift that curve down. You won't shift up, you won't shift down. Why? You just you will decrease the abundance. What that means is, if as when you shift that down, you can shift it down by much so that you're not totally excluded by xenon one time. For not that specifically about this single Higgs portal. Any particle physics model, if you extend more particles, put more particles into your model, make it more complicated, you won't enhance the abundance, you will decrease the abundance because you have just a space space integral. Okay? So you will just suppress your abundance. If you're interested in that, awesome. If you're trying to increase your abundance, if you are in a simplified dark matter model and your your particle is underabundant, you do it. Because you want to enhance it. Okay? So it's a simplified dark matter model. You're just saying, is excluded? Yeah, it's excluded. But this in this very specific regime, one single scalar period. <clears throat> just final remarks that we need to be at the resonance, whether it's the Higgs portal or the Z prime portal or Bhaskar portal. Okay? <clears throat> and there are lots of interesting things going on in indirect detection. Direct detection now became boring from my perspective. <clears throat> and but there are still things going on. I was very fortunate to decide to work on dark matter few years ago, because there are lots of things going on, lots of direct detection, we, we moved it from a theory-driven field to now to be data-driven field. That's very good, because physics is data, it's, that's all that is. And there is some, I put as footnote, because it deserves to be just a footnote, which is very recently, uh, there was a 2.4, 2.6 sigma, depending on which channel you're talking about right here. The CMS coloration observed some excess events in the EEJJ and UEJJ that would be consistent, it's not an evidence, consistent with 550, 650 GV leptoparts. So what we did in this paper with Hoover, former postdoc here, and Mistrumia was to how to account for this access two point something. So, okay, you already know. Two point something something is like, it's worth working on it as a theorist, but it's not something that you read, it's not a red bike. And we just showed there are some really nice connection between leptoparks and dark matter that can account for the data. It's really nice. So leptoparks in this scenario, to explain the CMS access, I haven't seen nobody like come up, coming up with a very different way to explain this. I've seen some people talking about WRs. I, I'm not sure if they're so plausible. It's debatable. Anyways, uh, leptoparks can be tied to dark matter and explain the CMS access. That's quite nice. I'd like to see them because they are observed in two different channels. And my conclusions are, we have all those messy signals. Are these all chasing emphasis? Maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> but 
regardless of that, it's very important for, for us to keep working on dark matter complementarity to put to the limp miracle to the test in the next decade. I, I think uh, most of the dark matter physicists would agree that if you don't see any limp signal by the end of this decade, lots of people will start shifting to different, not fields, but different dark matter candidates. Maybe actually will become the most popular dark matter fields in seven years from now. Probably I would, I would if I had to bet, my house on it, I would bet on that. But that's it. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Yeah, I have a one uh, question, comment on this prime photo. And uh, suppose you, you have a digest, but if you see the digest bump, is there any other channel? What's that again? Uh, okay. If you focus on the digest, mm -hmm. then if you see the bump, then this, this doesn't mean this is a di di dark matter scenario. If you see any collider signal, it will be more general than that. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that's dark matter. It just means that you have a stable enough particle in your detector. What I meant was that it's not moving to the dark matter scenario. Yeah, in this case was because the, the according to CMS data, the branch ratio could not be equal one into visible particles, so it has to be smaller than one. Um, Josh and... Uh, You're talking about Z-prime, right? Huh? You're talking about Z-prime. No, I, was talking, I thought you were referring to the, the left of parts case. No, you were saying the digest into Z-prime? Z-prime could have then you focus on different parameter space, you say that is the more feasible complex universe. Yeah. If that case, suppose I see some digest bump. Okay. Unless you come up with other channel, it's a consistent with that scenario, I can't tell anything. That's right. That that's correct. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the collider things, so people usually who are not, who don't work on astrophysics, they like the bad mouth, the indirect detection uh, signals, because they say, oh, we can't believe in indirect detection signals. But as far as dark matter is concerned, I, I really doubt that someone would be convinced by a collider signal regarding dark matter. Because you, you, how are you gonna claim that's dark matter? You can just claim that's stable enough in your detector. If you see a direct detection signal, I'll say, Done. We're done. Well, if it's consistent with other signals and so on, we have to double check with other experiments and so on and so forth. But if you have direct detection signal, for me, in my opinion, is the most compelling way to observe dark matter. In direct detection signal, you can always come up with background model uh, that is this and so that. Collider, well, maybe how you're going to claim is dark matter. You're just saying that the lifetime is longer than few seconds. So you cannot claim that you have a Dark matter part was produced as a detector. It just escaped your detector. How is it? How is that? It's very different from being dark matter and being stable enough for other purposes. But the complementary is still good because if you see something with very good similar properties in detectors or indirect detection, that's already very robust signal. Despite the fact that you can you can come up with background models in direct detection and come up with different models that address the collider signal, but if two different, totally different approaches have different, have one signal they are totally consistent with each other, that's a very robust signal. That's what, why people are so eager to see some bump in this Hooperon region somewhere else. Because if you've seen dwarfs, like, it's Nobel Prize. It's Nobel Prize. If we see dwarfs, Nobel Prize. We won't, I don't know, probably we won't see them. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank our speaker again.